Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Okay, we've spent a couple of lectures getting comfortable with this Landauer approach to carrier transport, which allows us to treat transport in very small devices, but also reduces to familiar expressions in long devices. Now we're ready to use it. So we'll dive in and we're going to apply this to the MOSFET. But we're going to assume now, in this lecture and for the rest of the week, that we're operating under ballistic conditions. Okay, so just a quick review. We have this conceptual picture of a small device. We have expressions for the current. We have expressions for the conductance when the applied voltages are small. And we've been getting familiar with this way of thinking about transport and with using these equations. And now we're ready to apply them to a MOSFET. Okay, so uh, remember, MOSFETs are all about modulating the height of a potential energy barrier that controls current flow. So here's a sketch of the conduction band diagram from the source with a source Fermi level, across the channel, out the drain with a drain Fermi level. We're going to focus on the top of the barrier. And the top of the barrier has a potential energy U, which is given by the conduction band edge in the absence of an applied potential, but then it's lowered whenever the surface potential or semiconductor potential is positive, we'll push the barrier down. When it's negative, we'll pull the barrier up. That's how we make a transistor. Now, this little part, this is the heart of the device. This is what we're going to think of as our nano device. It's characterized by some local density of states. We're just going to assume that it's the same kind of band structure that we would have in a large chunk of silicon. And as long as the channel doesn't get too small, that's a pretty good assumption. And we'll talk about what happens for really small channels later on in the course. So the device has a length script L, the heart of the device near the top of the barrier, which is actually less than the channel length. Now, I'll think of the region to the left of the device as just the contact that allows electrons to go in and out from the source. And I'll think of the part to the left of the top of the, or to the right of the top of the barrier as the second contact that allows electrons to go in and out of the drain. All right, let's go back to the IV characteristics and see if we can compute the IV characteristic first in the low applied voltage regime, then in the high applied voltage regime. So when we apply a small voltage between the drain and the source, then the Fermi functions of the two contacts, source and drain, are very close. We're in this small bias regime where the drain current should be proportional to the drain to source voltage, and the constant is the channel conductance. Let's compute the channel conductance. And let's do it with Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, because that makes things easy. Lots of conventional MOS theory is first done with Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, so it will make us it make it easier for us to relate what we get to more conventional expressions later. So here's our expression under small bias. And we know how to compute the number of channels as a function of energy. We're going to assume ballistic conditions, so transmission is 1. The Fermi function under the assumption that Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics apply. We'll just ignore this one, and then we get an exponential. And that means that the sheet carrier density, the number of carriers per square centimeter, is an effective density of states times e to the Fermi energy minus bottom of the conduction band over kT. Okay. So these are the expressions. We can use them to evaluate this channel current. Uh, before I do that, I just want to introduce one important quantity that's going to appear when we do these uh, equations, and we've seen a little bit of already in this course, but we'll see over and over again. If I plot as a function of velocity, remember uh, energy is one-half mv squared, so I could plot this non-degenerate Fermi function as a function of the x-directed velocity, and it would just be proportional to e to the minus one-half mvx squared, or I could plot it in the y direction too, and I would get a, in equilibrium, I would get a symmetrical Gaussian distribution. The average velocity in the x direction is zero, because any electron with a positive velocity, I have equal probability of having 
an electron with a negative velocity, so it all averages to zero. But if I compute the average velocity of the positive half, then I'll get a finite value. And I'll get an equal and opposite value for the average velocity of the negative half. This is what we call the unidirectional thermal velocity. And a simple calculation of that will give you 2 kT over pi m. So that'll be an important velocity that we'll see many times over. That is the average velocity in the direction of transport, taken as the x direction in our channel. Okay, known as the unidirectional thermal velocity. All right, so let's do the algebra. We start with our expression. We plug in the various terms for the expression. If I differentiate the Fermi function, since it's an exponential, it just gives me an exponential with a 1 over kT. If I insert a 1 for the transmission, if I insert, insert my expression for modes, if I insert my expression for the derivative of the Fermi function, then I have an integral that can be done. I'll skip the details and show you the result. The result is this. The channel conductance is proportional to the width of the channel. That makes sense. The wider it is, the more conduction channels there are. It's proportional to the sheet carrier density, or to the sheet carrier charge in coulombs per square centimeter. And then there's this unidirectional thermal velocity divided by 2 kT over Q. So we get a relatively simple expression for the ballistic current. And I'll just write it this way. Um, Q times N sub S is minus the electron charge per square centimeter in the channel. So we've computed the channel conductance under low drain to source voltage. Okay, so we have the first part of the problem. Let's look at the second part of the problem. But before we do that, I want to do just an aside and mention that uh, when we compute this channel conductance, and do this integral, one way that we could write this is as 2q squared over h times the number of ch channels in the Fermi window. That's something we discussed in the last lecture. And if you look at that, you know, the definition of the number of channels in the Fermi window is this. And when you do that, using the expressions we had in the previous slide, what you'll find is that the number of channels is proportional to the carrier density. So this is one of the important differences between completely degenerate conditions and completely non-degenerate conditions. Under non-degenerate conditions, the number of channels is proportional to the electron density. Under degenerate conditions, the number of channels is just the number at the Fermi energy. Now, unfortunately, most MOS transistors operate, unless we're in subthreshold, in some region between the non-degenerate and degenerate in which case we have to deal with Fermi-Dirac integrals and the expressions get a little more complicated. We're going to stick for the most part with Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics because it illustrates the essential physics, keeps the mathematics simple, and when we need to go back and be more careful, we can always do the math and evaluate the Fermi-Dirac integrals. Okay, now let's shift to the next part of the problem. Let's ask if we can compute the on current or the high voltage current. So we've applied a large voltage between the drain and the source. That large voltage pulls the Fermi level in the drain way down. That means that the Fermi function in the source is much bigger now than the Fermi level in the drain. So F1 is much, much bigger than F2. So when I take my current expression, you know, in the linear regime, we expanded this in a Taylor series expansion. In the high bias regime, I'll just neglect F2. So we'll get a an integral expression that will give us the current under high drain to source bias. Okay, we'll do it the same way. We have our expression for channels, ballistic transmission, Fermi function in the Maxwell-Boltzmann limit, unidirectional thermal velocity, and carrier density as related to the uh, location of the Fermi level. Now, there's one detail here before we do the math that I, I just want to discuss for a minute. Notice that there's an extra factor of two. You know, normally we say the sheet carrier density is the effective density of states times E to the Fermi level minus bottom of the conduction band over KT. But I've divided that by two in this case. Now, what's that all about? Let's take a look at that and see if we can figure that out. 
So the picture is something like this. At the top of the barrier, I've got a piece of semiconductor with a parabolic energy band to keep things simple. I have some Fermi level in the source, and electrons can come in and populate states. But electrons come in with positive velocity, meaning that they can only populate positive K states. So this half of the energy bands can be populated, but only half of the states are available to be populated by electrons that are coming in from the source. They can't populate the negative velocity states because they have positive velocities. The negative velocity states get populated by electrons coming in from the drain. They can propagate, uh, populate negative velocity states. So they're populated according to the Fermi level of the drain. The total number of electrons at the top of the barrier is the sum of the electrons with positive velocities which came in from the source, negative velocities which came in from the drain, and the total number is given by MOS electrostatics as C inversion times VG minus VT divided by Q. So MOS electrostatics demands that the total number be the same. Um, what's happened here is that under high drain bias, the Fermi level is so low that there's almost no probability that negative velocity states will be occupied. That means N sub S minus is close to zero, but the total N sub S now is just N sub S plus. The total value will not be half of what it was before because MOS electrostatics will, will move the barrier such that the total number of charges that are available on the gate are balanced in the semiconductor. And now it means that that total number is just all positive velocity electrons. So we use this expression with a factor of two. The factor of two means we're only dealing with positive velocity states under high drain bias. Okay, so now we can get back and just do the algebra. We have our drain current expression. We have expressions for everything that's inside that integral. Transmission is one because we're considering ballistic conditions. The number of channels we discussed before. The Fermi function is just the equilibrium Fermi function of the first contact. All right. Do that integral. That's an integral that we can uh, relatively easy to do. Final result is just current is proportional to width. That makes sense. Amount of charge in the inversion layer, that makes sense. And to the thermal injection velocity or the unidirectional thermal velocity. So Q times the sheet carrier density is just minus the inversion layer charge. So we have an expression for the current that looks like this. Okay, so we've done the high bias current as well. So let's recap. We first of all did the low bias current using the Taylor series expansion for F1 minus F2. We then did the high bias current saying that F1 was much bigger than F2 and we just ignored F2. We just did the integrals and we got these two expressions which look much different from the traditional textbook expressions that we discussed in week one for the IV characteristics of a MOSFET and we'll describe how they're related later on in the course, later on this week, in fact. Now, let's see if we can compute the entire IV characteristic, because that's something that's worthwhile to do as well. So, the entire IV characteristic is given by this expression, you know, and this applies both large and small drain biases. We just made approximations to get the current in the linear regime and in the saturated regime, but we can analytically compute the entire IV characteristic. Note that this is two terms. The first term I'll call ID1, the second term I'll call ID2. So it's just the current due to electrons coming in from the source minus the current due to the electrons coming in from the drain. You know, the first one here is just the integral that we did when we discussed the on current in the previous slide. So that's minus W. It's the charge due to electrons coming in with positive velocities from the source times the unidirectional thermal velocity. If I were to do the integral for the second one, I'd get the same kind of expression, except it would be the charge due to electrons with negative velocities. Okay. So if I want the net current, I subtract the current coming in from the source minus the current coming in from the drain, and I'll get an expression that looks like this. 
Let me do a little bit of algebra here now and pull out a QN plus, the part of the charge due to electrons with positive velocities. So I'll get this expression and a 1 minus ratio of the charges due to positive, negative velocity electrons divided by positive velocity electrons. Okay. So continuing, if I look at charge balance, the charge consists of both, in general, both electrons with positive velocities and negative velocities. Under high drain bias, there'll be few, if any, negative velocity electrons, but in general, they're both there depending on the drain bias. Now, the only difference between the negative velocity population and the positive velocity population is the fact that we have two different Fermi levels. Carrier densities are exponentially related to the location of the Fermi level. So the electron density due to electrons with negative velocities is reduced from the positive velocity value by this exponential factor, e to the minus q VDS over kT, because I've lowered the Fermi level in the drain by q times VDS. So there's a simple relation between the two. So the ratio is just given by that exponential factor. Okay. And that means that when I want the total charge, I simply add the positive charge and the negative charge, and I can express it in this way. All right. Just a little bit of bookkeeping. So now we can go back to our current expression. The current was due to electrons coming in from the source minus electrons coming in from the drain. We pulled out the electron charge with positive velocities and wrote it in this form. I now know that the ratio of the negative velocity charge due to, divided by the positive velocity charge is given by this exponential factor. And I know that when I add the two together, I just add the positive to the negative and I get a factor like this. And the final result is that we have an expression for the complete IV characteristic that reduces to the expression that we got for low drain voltage and to the expression that we got for high drain voltage, but that describes the entire IV characteristic at some fixed gate voltage as we sweep the drain to source voltage from zero to some value. Okay, so we succeeded. Once we understand this Landauer formalism, it's relatively easy to go back and derive the full range IV characteristics. We've got an expression now that gives us the complete IV characteristic of a ballistic MOSFET. This expression reduces to a simpler expression under low drain to source bias, and it reduces to a simple expression under high drain to source bias. So we've derived the IV characteristics of the ballistic MOSFET. But there's a lot more to discuss and to understand and to get comfortable with how does a ballistic MOSFET operate, what's different from the traditional MOSFET that we're used to thinking about. The next three lectures we're going to spend diving a little more deeply into this mathematics that we've done and seeing if we can develop more physical insight into what's going on here. So we'll begin that discussion in lecture four next time. Thank you.